Today, God's position on pornography. We're looking again in Colossians chapter 2. Our primary verse will be verse number 8. And then we're going to look at Colossians 3, 1 through 7. So if you'll mark that in your Bible. Now, the book of Colossians, I did preach on a Wednesday night series through the book of Colossians probably about 15 years ago. It was one of the first Bible books I taught as I became pastor of River of Life. So about four of you were here during that. And we went two or three years through the book of Colossians. And uh, I love that book. It's a great book. But I've got a feeling those of you who were here, you probably need just a little refresher. I know I'm a great teacher and I taught you everything you need to know about Colossians. And, but... Just feel like maybe we need to refresh just a little bit. Who wrote the book of Colossians? Apostle Paul. We know that. He, 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 he's the title of, of the writer of that book. So we know Colossians was written by Paul. But it's interesting to know. Well, let's back up just a little bit more. Colossian, Colossae was, is today what is known as modern day Turkey. Wednesday nights we've been dealing with Peter's writings, the epistles that Peter wrote to the churches scattered as the gospel, as persecution, Jesus was crucified and ascended, and then the church came under heavy persecution. Those Jewish Christians in Israel and in, in Jerusalem were scattered, and they were running for their life. Many of them were killed and torn asunder, and so the Lord was scattering the gospel. He was scattering the church, and they wound up in Asia Minor, up in the seven churches you read about in Revelation that were planted as missionary churches where the gospel, where the church was formed, where it was after Pentecost as the local congregations grew and the apostles discipled them. But this church that Peter, Paul is writing to in Colossae is a church he never visited. Paul never went there. He didn't know anything really about this church. He had never been there. He had never met with this congregation. We don't really know how this church came to being or how it was formed or who was it. But we do know that the pastor at this time was a, was a, was a pastor by the name of Epaphras. Epaphras. And he came. Paul was in jail. He was imprisoned in Rome. And uh, his friend, this pastor from the church at Colossae, modern-day Turkey, he made a trip all the way to Rome because there was a problem in the church. And so he had to have some help. So he went and laid it before the Apostle Paul. And Paul, as a result of their conversation, Epaphras brought him the news about the controversy in the church. Paul, under the anointing of the Holy Spirit, he wrote this book. Now, what is the subject of the book? What was the problem in the church? Well, let me, before I give you that information, it was dividing the church. It was tearing the church up. It was hurting the gospel. It was doing damage. So it was demonic. It was satanic. And, and Satan was the, the author and, and the finisher of that, that spirit of confusion and, and trouble that he was bringing on the church, trying to destroy it from the inside. What is that? Well, let me read verse number 8 in Colossians chapter 2. Again, he's dealing with the issue. So that's the context to always find out what's going on. Why this verse? See, if we just pull verses here and there, we can make them proof text. Now, you've got to know what's going on. Why, what is the purpose of this book? And he begins to deal with it here in verse number 8 in Colossians chapter 2. Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men. The traditions of men are always going to be after the flesh. It's going to be a flesh-based thing, right? It's going to be something that feels good, looks good, brings pleasure to the flesh. And so that we, we know right there he's dealing with a flesh issue that's, that's being taught theologically in the church after the rudiments of the wor world and not after the Christ. Now, Father, I ask that you'd give us some insight from this passage and from the problem that they were dealing with that even the church today is dealing with. And we pray that it be exposed, the enemy be exposed for the liar that he is, that truth would abound, and that, that, that liberty and, and freedom would be the result because it's truth that sets us free. We declare freedom in this house today. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, the heresy that... That Epaphras made a trip all the way to Rome to talk to the Apostle Paul about is what was known in biblical days as Gnosticism. Gnosticism. I have a slide in case you don't know how that word is spelled. Just Peggy, if you'll bring that up. That one, Gnosticism. You'll see it there. It was a heresy that 
uh, is derived from several sources. It denied, primarily denied the supremacy and sufficiency of Christ as head of the church. And so right there we know it was an attack upon Christ. And uh, again, Gnosticism or Gnostics, these were those who were heading and leading this, this uh, heresy. And it, it's complicated and there are a lot of uh, minutiae and fine points to it. But primarily, again, it attacks the su sovereignty and sufficiency of Christ. And, and his headship over the church. But it also, and here was the primary teaching, it, it, again, the traditions of men, flesh thing, the Gnostics taught that all physical matter was innately evil, but the mind or the soul was intrinsically good. And so they understood, as we should understand, that we're two part. We have an eternal part and we have a, 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 a finite part because of sin. The flesh man, and the soul, the eternal part, the, not the, the spirit, that the third part that comes when we receive Christ, but we're flesh and we're eternal soul. Now, what the Gnostics taught was there was a division between the two and that, that, uh, that flesh was completely evil, but the soul was completely intrinsically good. In other words, the Gnosticism saw no relationship between body and soul. They divorced the material world from the spiritual world and believed that however men behave physically had no bearing on their spiritual welfare. Are you getting this? Are you beginning to see why it was worth a trip all the way to Rome? And why Paul dealt with it immediately and the Holy Spirit spoke to it immediately? Uh, this, this Gnosticism was a problem in the early churches. It was being formed. But, I think, when they brought the word of truth and, and the Holy Spirit began to write and come against it and show that it was not of God, it was not a, 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 a spiritual fundamental teaching of the church, it died out. However... In the late middle 1960s, there was a resurgence. How many of you were alive in the 60s, you hippies? Peace. Cool, dude. It's all groovy. Come on, let's go back to the 60s a little bit. I was just a young folk, but I still remember uh, being the Beatle era. The, the America changed in the middle 60s. It, it, it was the hippie era, the, 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 the flower power and the free love. It was the beginning of the modern day drug, drug culture and a stepping stone for Eastern mysticism that brought it into Western society. It rejected Christianity wholesale and rejected Christianity wholesale. The hippie philosophy divorced Morality and spirituality. You remember that? Some of you were involved in that. Maybe somebody here went to Woodstock or you claim you did. That's the era that I'm talking about. Um, and so they, they divorced morality and spirituality. That's Gnosticism. It severed the body from the spirit and the result was sexual promiscuity. It created a permissive society. It was birthed right there in the 60s. Today, almost six decades later, the Western world today, we're reaping the fruit of that permissive society that was birthed right there in America in the, in the mid-60s. We're living now in a sex-mad, drug-infested world. Am I telling the truth up here this morning? I'm giving you the facts, the cold, hard facts. The world has changed beyond even recognition. America has been transformed by what started in the 60s. And, um, and one of the great evidences of that is the growth and profusion of pornography in our society. It has its place, its roots in Gnosticism. That was the world the church, the early church was born into. That is the world this last day church is in dealing with even today. So I want to speak on that subject, the, the subject of pornography. It's not something I want to do. As a matter of fact, I thought to myself, if I just kept quiet, because you know, 
the whole month of September, we stepped away from Word of God speak. I'd already told you I had two more and we'll come back to them. But I said to myself, if I don't say anything about that, I bet they forget. <laughs> and I can just move on to something else and never have to. I don't want to preach this message. It, but it needs to be preached. Can I get an amen this morning? And I know today even our number is down. Maybe the word got out. I did put the bulletin in the thing. And I know it's one of those messages no one wants to listen to, no one wants to deal with. But I feel like it's very important that I take the time this morning not just to share this with you, but to put it on tape. Because I believe that some who wouldn't come to church today because they're too ashamed, because they're dealing with, the devil has them locked away, bound with an addiction to pornography, and they're, they're, they're just completely destroyed by it, and they can't even come to church because of the shame. The Lord is going to bring them to this message, and they're going to find deliverance. Would, would we agree together on that today? There's deliverance in the name of Jesus. He can set you free today. There is hope. And so let's deal with that subject, even though we don't want to, but let's deal with it today. First, let's talk about the spread of pornography. And again, I'm going to stay pretty close to my notes until I get to point number three, which is good because I'm giving you a lot of facts. It's also good that I don't chase rabbits usually when I'm reading it off the manuscript. So we'll go a lot faster if I stay to my notes. But to start with, do you know and do you understand that right now there are powerful people in business and powerful business minds in our country who are working hard every moment of their life to try to get you and your family addicted and hooked on pornography? Do you know that? There is a scheme. Why is that? Because it's profitable. Because it makes money. And that which makes money drives this nation. And so the great business minds have bought into it and they're participating in it and they're doing everything they can, everything they can to try to, to get you addicted to this form of slavery. And their motive, pure and simple, is money. Seven point industry stats that really need to change, church. First, porn sites, here's the first one, receive more regular traffic than Netflix, Amazon, and Twitter combined each month. The sex business in America has revenues of more than $12 billion a year. <coughs> That's more, what's this thing, the combined revenues. And again, that word combined revenues of all professional football, baseball, and basketball franchises combined. The, it, the, the, that's a number more uh, greater than the combined revenues of ABC, CBS, and NBC combined. It's more money than the Hollywood movie industry generates in the United States. 35% of all internet downloads are porn related. 34% of internet users have been exposed to unwanted porn via ads, pop-ups. 34%, I think, what? That's got to be a lower number. That, the, the truth of that has got to be higher than that. Uh, because, the, the, listen, they're working to try to addict you. How they do that? By, by tricking you. By popping it up. By sending you spam emails. I shared with the Wednesday night crowd my first, first exposure to internet porn when we just got the internet in our house. We had a... <laughs> anybody remember dial up? And had, had Wendy, she's just a little bitty girl, just a little bitty girl. We were living in the trailer on off of Husha 2 and, and she came home from school and, and she needed to do a, a paper on India. I remember on India. And I said, well, let's just let's dial it up and we'll Google it out and we'll get you some information. We'll get this paper done tonight. <laughs> Let me just offer this. Don't type in India and hit search. Because what came up had nothing to do with a country. That's how they get you. And imagine if that, that would have been a little 11-year-old, 12-year-old boy. And see things he shouldn't see. How, I, I, I'm not going to take a poll, but would you agree with me that 34% uh, is a low number? I think it's probably closer to 100%. If you've been on the internet, you have seen something that has come to your browser and that you was not looking for. And it shocked you. It's happened here at the church. It's happened in our office. 
It, 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 and you know what? I, 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 I've got to do this. And I didn't realize it until I was listening to another pastor preach of a large church, a large ministry who's preaching on the subject of pornography. And he shared this. He said, you know what? The busiest day for internet pornography traffic is Sunday. He said, our church, believe it or not, we've had to put a, uh, a filter on our internet because Sunday we have people coming to church looking at pornography. And you know what? I think I'm going to have to get busy on that. The River of Life, we need to put a filter on our internet. We need, I didn't even know it was possible, so I did some research on that. And so we're going to try to filter that down because, listen, everybody in the neighborhood knows what our internet is. These kids come up here all the time and sit out here all day and all night and look at stuff and tie into the internet. It's free. So we've got to filter that. Even here. You would think in church that there'd be any place it'd be safe. Not so. Porn, here's another step. Porn increased um, marital infidelity by 300% that in Facebook. How many of you know someone's lost their marriage because of Facebook? I do. They hook up with some old girlfriend they hadn't seen since high school and start chatting. And for the next thing you know, they're, they're running off somewhere. Here, here, here's a fifth step. At least 30% of all data transferred across the internet is porn related. 30% of everything done on the internet is porn related. Globally, porn is a $97 billion industry. In 2016 alone, 4.5 billion hours of porn was watched. We got some problems. Now, listen to this. 90% of teens and 96% of young adults are in either encouraging, accepting, or neutral when they talk about porn with their friends. Half of adults 25 and older, only half of adults 25 years and older believe porn is wrong. Teens and young adults 13 to 24 believe not recycling is worse than viewing porn. These stats need to change. Pornography defined. Let me give you the definition. You can look it up in the dictionary and you'll find pictures, writings, or other material that is sexually explicit, explicit and sometimes equates sex with power and violence. Pornography is derived from the Greek term meaning the writing of harlots. From porno or pornea, sexual immorality, and gra graphy or graphic to write or to picture. The Langford Report, and I have a picture of the book. This was a book that, uh, report that was done on pornography a few years back. It defines pornography as the following, and I think this is a good definition. The commercial exploitation of sex designed to stimulate sexual excitement with special reference to abnormalities and perversion. When I speak of pornography today, I want to make sure we understand going in I'm not going to divide what we call soft core or hard core. Porn is porn. They're like trying to divide a soft bullet and a hard bullet. They'll both kill you. Pornography, even if you say it's just, it's just, you know, soft, it's a gateway. And it will lead you to hard core. And the skip is a short one. All pornography, I'm going to go ahead and get this on record, is dirty, it's filthy, it's perverted, and it is wrong. Whether you call it soft or hard, it is wrong. And God is not in it. He's not for it. Now, we've talked about the stats that need to change on pornography. Let's, let's clean up the house. Judgment begins here in the house of the Lord. We understand the world is... is <laughs> Is, is going to hell in a handbasket. We should be surprised with technology and pornography that is growing at such a rate that shouldn't surprise us because without Christ, we're just walking around little flesh machines. You have no, you have no, nothing to keep you from it. But what about the saint and pornography? Boy, even saying that sounds contradictory, doesn't it? Can you believe you put those two words in the same sentence? Saints 
and pornography. Those two words don't complement each other. But the truth of the matter is, in many Christian homes and in the church today, pornography is a problem. We can sit here and play like we don't think it is, and all, you know that's just not true at church, but it is a problem in the church today. Porn stats in the church. Let me give you a few of the most recent that I did some research on this. Again, yeah, this just blows my mind, but it is what it is. And when that, what was the name of that Ashley Matt, 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 Madison? Was that the name of it? You remember when that broke and when all the names were revealed from that uh, affair website? It was men would go on there to, to looking to have an affair on their wife. And it was full of pornography. The whole thing was adultery and sexual perversion. Several pastors were outed. That, that's what made me... Uh, if, if, before that happened, I would have never believed the stats I'm fixing to share with you. Even one of our trainers, one of our seminary professors at New Orleans Seminary, you may remember this happened a couple years ago when that broke and his name was out and he was a seminary professor at a Southern Baptist, one of the large Southern Baptist seminaries where I went to school. When he was outed, he took his own life. And so... Until that happened, I didn't realize this, this was such a problem. But listen to some of these stats. One in five youth pastors, one in seven senior pastors use porn on a regular basis and currently struggle. That, that's more than 50,000 U.S. church leaders. I'm talking about Christian churches. 43% of senior pastors and youth pastors say they have struggled with pornography or are struggling with pornography. That's nearly half. 64% of Christian men and 15% of Christian women say they watch porn on a regular basis. Only 7% report their church has a ministry program for those struggling with porn. You know why that is? Because nobody will come. That's the problem, isn't it? The devil has unlocked a way and the shame keeps them from getting free because it's truth that sets you free. And what man wants to admit he's got a porn problem? Back to Colossians 2.8. Boy, that's depressing, isn't it? You know what? As I was preparing this message and looking at these stats, I kept crying out, Maranatha, Lord, Maranatha. Maranatha. Because I hold them precious new grandbabies. Pure. They're still sinners. they still got a corrupted seed in them. But right now they're pure. And I want them to stay that way. And so I cry out, Maranatha, Lord, come quickly. The only hope for this world is Jesus. But Jesus is the answer. But here in Paul's letter to Colossae, battling this Gnosticism, beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy. Spoil there means to lead away, to take captive, to, to, make, uh, to make loot of you, to take you as a slave. And to make money off you, to, 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 to profit from you and from your bondages. He says, beware lest any man spoil you through what? The philosophy. The. What was it? Ancient Gnosticism. Again, it was the philosophy and the theology that divorced the body from the soul. That separated morality from spirituality. It's easy to rationalize this stuff. And to say, well, God made me this way. He gave me these desires. God, it's your fault. This is woman you gave me. And then there's always going to be some church or some apostate, some preacher, somebody who will come and say, well, you're right. God understands. You're young. You'll grow out of it. It's not all right. As long as you got your soul right, as long as you're right with the Lord spiritually, then, hey, He understands. It's rationalizing. That's Gnosticism. It's the playboy philosophy. And it's captivating the hearts and the minds of Christian men. What is happening here is the modern day church is buying into the world philosophy of neo-Gnosticism. Gnosticism, he, he deals with it now in chapter 3. Look down at verse number 5 in chapter 3. He kind of tells us here, 
If you buy into that, if you rationalize that what God made you with these desires, and if you color outside of the lines, He expects that, He get, He understands, and uh, he, he, it's going to be all right. He, you know, he, it's not your fault. You're a good person. It's okay. Just get saved and it'll be all right. He says, here are the marks. Here's the result. Here's what Gnosticism will produce. He says, therefore, your members which are upon the earth, here they are, fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, and covetousness, which is idolatry. He lists these five things that if you buy into that, and if you, if you decide you want to follow the apostate theology of Gnosticism, here's what you're going to look like. Here's where you're going to wind up. First, fornicator. Fornication. What is that? What is, you know, the word, word is in the Greek, pornea. Sounds familiar. It's a general word for sexual immorality. Here's what you look it up. It, it means unlawful sex. Unlawful sex. What is that? God gave the laws about sex. He established the law. What is the law of sex? One man, male, one female, joined in holy matrimony for life, forever. That's the law. If you're going to have legal sex, that's it. Any sex that is not between a husband and a wife, a male and a female, is unlawful. It's fornication. Whether you're married or unmarried, it is unlawful. It's fornication. That's how we define that word. That's the result of Gnosticism. Divorcing the physical from the spiritual. You will find yourself breaking God's law. Right? It's unlawful. I had... Several years ago, it's probably been 15, 16 years ago, I had a kid come to me one Wednesday night. We've had a lot of kids come through here, so don't try to figure out who I'm talking about. We've had kids that come, and we've ministered to a lot of different kids. And I had a kid about, he was probably about 14, 15. He came in and said, I'm homosexual. I like boys. And I said, first of all, let's just get down to the nitty-gritty and the facts of the issue. You ain't supposed to be sexual with nothing. <laughs> Any sex outside of marriage is not permitted. So let's not make it a homosexual issue. Let's make it a sex issue. Take sex off the table. You're too young. Go, on, go to the playground and play. Get you a baseball and throw the baseball. Let the, don't even let the devil get this in your mind right now. You're to be absent. You're to be sexually uninvolved right now. Don't make it a homosexual issue. Just, just make it a sex issue. Now, when here, if you want to grow up and get married, and then, but that's legal marriage. That's legal sex. Anything, and that's good. It's, uh, hey, 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 I'm going to stop right there, but that God's good. Amen. Give me an amen, somebody. We need an amen. This message ain't getting me no amen. So I just. Fornication, it's unlawful sex. Uncleanness, what is that? That is, that is uh, really, it's a mental. It's, it's a, it's a, a, a what, what we call it? Dirty mind. You know, somebody's got a filthy mind. They're always thinking a sexual angle. That any conversation, everything's, they, they, every comment they make has got a sexual connotation to it. Inordinate affection. What is that? That's that, here's a word that maybe you'll understand better. It's a more of a modern word. Just put right down the word fetish. In other words, adultery between a male and a female. That's boring. That's old. We got to find another thing. Kinky stuff. That's what that means. In order to fix, that's what homosexuals and, and all manner of stuff that I, don't, I can't even comprehend that's going on today. That's, that, 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 if you're not careful, if you go down to Mardi Gras in New Orleans, you probably see it done right on the streets. Evil concupiscence. What is that? Let me tell you what that is. That literally means evil that brings harm. 
Let me, let me describe that. Rape. Brutality. Victim. When, when that person has, has, has had a sexual encounter, the person they've encountered has left her is a victim. And there's a lot of that today. And, and, and a lot of it has its roots in this Gnosticism. Well, God made me this way. I can't help it. It just makes me feel happier when I beat her a little bit. Evil concupiscence, covetousness, which is what idolatry tells us what that is. That's whoremongering. That's when the wife that I have is I don't want her no more. Or I, I, I would be happier with it. That's what God says. That's what the nation of Israel is. That's what idolatry is. You're not happy with me anymore. So you go looking for somebody else. You go looking for another lover. That's what covetousness is. And all these are results of neo-gnosticism, which is alive and well today. What are the natural consequences? i got to step on the gas a little bit. I, I, I'm, I'd like to have a little more time at the end, but I, I've got to deal with these things. The devil's such a liar. One of the reasons he's got so many people addicted because they have bought into Gnosticism. And they've left Bible preaching, Bible believing churches because it's too hot in the kitchen. They want to go find them one of these false prophets that we've been dealing with on Wednesday nights that themselves are whoremongers, many of them. When the truth comes out, they're adulterers, they're playboys, and they're teaching and preaching a gospel of neo-Gnosticism that, you know, God understands... Grace, grace. Do whatever the heck you want to do six days. Just come up here and confess it to God and everything's going to be fine. God knows you're a sinner. Neo-Gnosticism. Now what is the result of this trap of pornography? If you buy into that and you become a victim and a slave to it, what are the results? What will happen? What are the natural consequences of it? Of of, of Whoremongering and pornography, dependency. I wrote that down. Here's the, and all of these have D I, I, on your outline. I only have six, but I threw another one in there just for good measure. Dependency. Pornography creates addiction, just as alcohol, drugs, or, or tobacco. It's a chemical thing. It's a chemical release. Every time you look at pornography, young men especially, there's a new neuro chemical addiction. There's a there's a it, it is and you gotta have a fix. And it hooks you. You're drawn to it as as a as a heroin addict is to heroin. To the, the first was dependency, depression. Why is that? Why does depression come with it? Because God made us for intimacy. Sex was never to be a solo thing. It's with a partner. It's with a wife. There's, there's sharing. And sex without that leaves you lonely. There's no intimacy in pornography. Disillusionment, that's the third one. Disillusionment. The real world can never live up to the fantasy world. And you become disillusioned with your wife or with your girlfriend because she can't do it like porn girl did. She don't look like porn girl did. Who's, who, who, boy, I better be careful here. Most of it's surgical. It ain't real. It's lights and photoshopping. Isn't it frustrating to try to live up when somebody's watching porn and you're trying to live up to their fantasy? My goodness, I don't look like them boys do. I look pretty good. At least you got one amen from my wife. She just left me hanging right on out here by myself, didn't she? At least I should got one amen. I'll back up and give her a do over. You don't even know what I'm talking about? Yes, I do. <laughs> okay. Defilement. Here's the fourth one. Better move off that. Paul said in Philippians, he said, Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, just, pure, lovely, Good report. If there be any virtue, any praise, think on these pure. Porn is anything but pure. Holy. Just. 
A man who is focusing, a person who is focusing on pornographic images cannot be obedient to that verse. Deceit. See, that's the problem with porn. It's, it's a lie. It's living a lie. A, and a porn addict is a serial adulterer. Because Jesus said if you look at a woman and lust at her, you've committed adultery. You've had sex with her. And that person has divorced their moral life from their spiritual life. So they come to church on Sunday and they believe that they can worship God and have, a, have the God thing on Sunday and still go right on back to their porn. He has deceived himself. He can't. And the result of that is no matter how much he tries to justify it and rationalize it and say, well, you know, and by into Gnosticism, there's still, there's still the Holy Ghost who's convicting. There's still the Word of God who's convicting. You can lie. You can believe a lie. You can hear a lie. You, you can have a lying preacher. But the Holy Spirit's going to tell you the truth. And when it's wrong, you know it. And you feel guilty. And you feel shame. Degradation. That's the sixth thing. That person is, is the person who has a porn addiction is more likely to commit adultery and even rape because that, that, that's been programmed in them. And I, and I thought, at this point, I thought of the hypocrisy we've witnessed and we've watched of some of these Hollywood actresses who in one moment, they're naked, jumping in and out of bed with anybody. And then the next minute, they're out in the streets boycotting and throwing a fit because someone has sexually abused them. Now come on. Let's just use some, let's just wise up and ask a question here. Let's just deal with the facts here. You, you strike a match and then complain when you get burned and there's a fire. Man, if you really care about sexual purity and men behaving themselves, keep your clothes on. Quit profiting off of pornography. You start, you the one that created this monster by getting naked in front of them. And then you have the audacity to get in the front of the Supreme Court and, 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 and cry out against. I'm a country boy. And I don't, I'm not the smartest person in this room. I, I know that. But I got enough sense to know something's wrong with that picture. I wrote down the seventh one, destruction. Satan has an agenda. Let me tell you, God is not in pornography. Can we get an agreement on that? Are we in agreement on that today? Who is behind it? The enemy. It is a demonic from the very pit of hell. Come on. And he has an agenda. The world will profit off of it, but the agenda, the profit of the enemy is to kill to steal and to destroy. And if you keep buying into Gnosticism and I'm okay and God knows He's made me this way and you get up from River of Life, a Bible-believing, Bible-preaching church and go find you an apostate church and get comfortable there in your sin, you still ain't going to run away from it. It's going to catch up with you. It's going to hurt you because it is satanic and every satanic addiction brings death. It will hurt you. It will destroy your marriage. It will destroy your life. And here, even at River of Life, we've seen the destruction. It's something that seems so innocent. And is, I don't want to get into that. Just be careful. The solution. Let's wrap this up. I, I, I hate this message. I hate preaching. I, it's a shame that I got to preach this. I mean, we ought to write about it and write books about it so the world can get saved and learn how to get out of it. The, the church shouldn't be dealing with this. Colossians 3.1 gives us the answer. Let me read this passage. There's seven, seven verses here. And I, want, I want you to highlight. Take your pencil and highlight. Because he, in these seven verses, he gives us the way out. It's simple. I don't have to spend another 30 minutes. It just falls right out of this day. Paul is dealing with the result of Gnosticism, what fornication, all these things he knew were in the church and they were dealing with because they had bought into this bad theology, neo-Gnosticism, 
or Gnosticism that separated the physical and the spiritual. And just, you know, whatever you do over here, that's, that's one thing, and God understands that, and that's going to die anyhow. Mm -hmm. we're, we're, we're one person. If, and that really translates, it might in your Bible, if you have something other than King James, say, since, since ye then be risen with Christ, Seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. So, highlight that S word, seek. You see it there? Seek. Secondly, set. Highlight that word, set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth, for you are dead, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with Him in glory. Here's the fifth word. It's, it's not S in the, uh, in the English word, but the, we can bring it from the text. Mortify. Mortify. Therefore, your members which are upon the earth. And he lists those. He said, which things sake, for which things sake, the wrath of God coming on the children of disobedience. In other words, the world is going to be judged heavily for this. The world is going to burn up. He's writing to Christians, believers, men who are saved, who are addicted to pornography. He says that they're catching eternal punishment over this. And so, in that which you also walked sometime when you lived in them. This is what marked your life. Three things. If you're here and you're listening to me and you have a porn addiction and you want to be delivered, you want to be free, because you're never going to be free or delivered until you want to be. That's true about losing weight. That's true about stop smoking. That's true about any addiction. You've got to, it, it is a mental thing. You've got to wake up one day and say, that's it. You've got to draw a line and say, that's it. No one can do it for you. Don't you wish you could? Don't you wish, hey, maybe you've got a family member that's struggling with drugs or alcohol, and don't you wish you could have set them free? You could have chose what they put in their bodies? But we can't. You are the one who's responsible. And if you want to be free, listen to me, listen to me today. If you want to be free, there is no sin that can hold you. There is not a demon or a devil himself in hell or all the armies of the enemy bound together can stop you from getting liberated today if you want to be. Amen. And you can, and the devil will say, well, don't listen to that because you've tried that. There's your problem. You've tried. Let's do it God's way. Let's do it God's way. If you want out, you can get out today. But you're not going to do it on your own. Seek. That's the first thing he said, right? Write that down. Seek. Seek those things which are above. And he, he's very specific as he says, seek who? Mm. Who's above? Seek Christ. Seek Jesus. Listen, the secret to a godly life. A godly life is not filled with pornography. And without godliness, without purity, no one will see God. Blessed are pure in heart, they see God. A godly life. Be ye holy. Be ye holy. You want to see God. You want to have God in your life. You want to walk in the Spirit. Walk in the things of God. You've got to live a godly life. And it cannot involve pornography. It cannot have pornography in it. And the secret to a godly life is very simple. It relies on the proper relationship with Christ. That's what it says. Seek Christ. A relationship that's dependent upon His power. What's the power? The Holy Spirit yeah. that raised Him from the dead. Our agent, the power. And the power of the Holy Spirit is greater than any power. That's God in the Spirit. Walk in the Spirit. You'll not fulfill the lust of the flesh. The godly life, a life free of pornography, is not following a set of rules and do's and don'ts and observances or rituals or, or any of that. It, that. That's dependent upon our strength. It's not 12 steps that i got to follow. It's not my strength. It's His strength. It's His ability. In my strength, I always come up short. There is no temptation taking you. That is not common. It goes all the way back to Papyrus in his church in Colossae. Paul's dealing with it. 
And we're dealing with issues, sexual immorality, sexual sin, pornography, and these issues. There is nothing new. You're not dealing with, I know it's, it's, it's it, when I grew up and when I went through the fires of, 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 of hormonal, hormonal teenage years. But you know what? There are a few advantages of getting old. <laughs> it scares me to think when I went through the 16, 17, and 18 and made it through there as still a virgin, what would have happened had I had an iPhone? Broadband connection. Phone pornographic pictures and movies and at 7 o'clock TV. Pornography stuff that, that, that used to not never. You couldn't even watch it in the middle of the night. It's right on 7 o'clock now. It's accepted. There is no temptation taking you that is not common. And God has not made a way of escape. You've got to be honest to that. You've got to say, hey... There is a way out if I want it. If you're addicted to pornography, you're, listen to me today, you're either, either lost or severely backslidden. You are not right with God. It is impossible to love Christ and love the world. It is impossible. You can't drink from both cups. The first thing you must do is repent. Repent. Confess it. Own it. I have sinned. Quit rationalizing. Quit blaming God and own it today. I am not right with God. I don't care if I'm the pastor. I don't care if I'm the worship leader. I don't care if I'm a, this one or that one or Sunday school teacher. If you are involved with pornography, you are not right with God. And you need to repent. You need to fall before God and confess, first of all, I am a sinner. I've left my first love. So the first thing, you've got to seek Him. But here's the good news. If you seek Him with your heart, you'll find Him. Amen. And you'll find the one who'll set you free. The second word, set. Look at verse number two. Set your affections. That's one word in the Greek, and it, it, it's mental. It's the mind. Your translation may use that. Set your mind. It means to direct your thoughts. What, you, what you're thinking about. We have control over our mind. That's why we should never have an idle mind. That's why you should never pick up a flipper and just flip channels. No, no, we've got to be careful with lies what I see. We, we've got control. We get to say what we let in, what we don't let in. You're the one who decides. And every morning when we get up, and we, we wake up, we wake up from unconsciousness and we become conscious. Our minds are a blank canvas. And then as we go through life, we decide what we're going to let come into our, our, our brains. That's why most of you are in trouble. The first thing you do is flip on the computer. And start flipping around, looking here, looking there. Next thing you know, you're off in the twilight zone. No, get up and get in God's Word. Get up and get into the presence of Jehovah. Seek Him. Seek Christ. Get in and, de and devotions there. Fill your mind with, hey, the psalmist said, how can we cleanse our mind? How can a young man walk in this dirty world and walk in purity, walk in holiness? It's by the studying, the believing, and the whole, and the honoring, and the obedience to this book. Look it up. It's in Psalm 119. Ephesians 5, God talks about sanctification of the church and sanctifying church. And the question is, how is He going to sanctify His church? And he answers it by the washing of the Word. That's how sanctification... You avoid this book and you'll take anything. The world, the devil's got you because you're not in this book. Maybe that's how I've missed pornography is the book. I've given my life to this book. Man, you're not going to read a little of the Word and then watch a little bit of Playboy at the same time. One's going to cancel out the other. Seek and set and mortify. I wrote this word I, to keep my S's flowing. Seek, set, and slay. Mortify, slay. Hey, and, and you know what? You look that up in your concordance. I'm wrapping this up. I'm finished. You, you look that up in your concordance. And it means to deprive the power. To destroy the strength of. I got to thinking about the physical body. What 
causes physical strength. Eating. You stop eating, and you're going to get weak. Where does energy come from? Your body burns food. You feed. You feed the flesh. And you, and you have strength. You, get, you, you eat your spinach, you get muscles. Strong to the finish when I eat my spinach. <laughs> do, do, do you make the correlation, the connection? So the word mortify means to, to, to deprive it of its strength. Starve it. How do you stop an addiction? You starve that sucker. Again, I've used this illustration before. I heard this a few years ago. A black pastor was at the gas station buying gas. The man asked him, how you doing, pastor? Said, I'm doing good. He said, some days, though, it's like I got two dogs in me fighting. I got a good one, I got a bad one. And they fight all the time. The flesh and the spirit. The man said, well, who's winning? He said, the one that feeds the most. You speak, feed your spirit, you'll starve that flesh. You feed that flesh, you'll starve the spirit. It's all about what you eat. Mortify, starve it. Just, just stop it. First, supply Jesus. Seek Him. Seek Him with all your heart. Hey, and the Lord is good forever. Whatever you're addicted to today, it's only as good as the last time you had it. You gotta have it again. You gotta have more of it. And it's passing away. But the Lord is good forever. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. He will, he will deliver you today. He will. We already had the invitation. I told Lolly and Brother Dwayne when I came in, I'm not going to give a public invitation behind this message. I believe it's the first time I've ever done this. Because ain't nobody coming. You don't have to play anything, Brother Dwayne. We're fixing to pray and leave. <laughs> We's through. We are finished. Because who's coming after a message like that? Let's just be real. I ain't going down there because everybody thinks I'm a porn addict. It ain't no laughing matter, but that's the truth. And you never, listen, that's why it's such a bad addiction. It's because until you are truthful and honest and get an accountability partner, you probably will not win this battle. Truth sets you free. And so here's the deal. I'm offering you. I promise you, if you have a problem with pornography, and you come to me in private, that's where to stay. I will not judge you. I will not jump to conclusion that you must be a, a dirty dog. No, I know the power of the enemy. Yeah. I've witnessed the destruction. Yeah. And I don't want that to happen ever again. <coughs> I talked to Jesse. And I told him I was preaching this message. He said, good. He wishes he could be here right now to testify. We don't want to ever see that again. But it could be. If you stay on the road, you're inbound. You get free today. So the invitation is not public. It's very private today. If you're female and you'd rather talk to Lila, she's a, she makes herself available. We're available 24-7. You may have to move some things around. But I walk. I, that's the advantage of living this close. I can slip over here in the cover of darkness. Nobody ever knows. But you've got to make the move. But I promise you, complete and total, no one will ever know this between me and you. And I will not judge you. I will be your friend. And I'll help you any way that I can. That's all we can do. And we'll pray for you today. Why don't we stand up? Let's stay. Our prayer today before we leave. I put it on the cover of the bulletin. Psalm 51. Maybe you're here and you say, well, I don't have a porn addiction. It's never really been my problem. But you got a problem. We all have a sin problem. We all sin and come short of the glory of God. We've got a problem. It might not be a place where it's an addiction. But you've got something that, that Satan constantly beats you up with and uses to try to keep you separated from God's glory. 
And so I think the psalmist, he knew he had sin issues. He had, you know what got David in trouble? Pornography. He looked at a naked woman that wasn't his wife when he should have been somewhere else. It wasn't the first look. Sometimes you can't help the first look. I mean, you, you, they stuck that Hooters girl up on that billboard and I didn't know it was there. But if I keep driving by and keep looping around, then that's where the problem is. I mean, sometimes they sneak that stuff on you. You'll get a pop-up that you wasn't looking for. But it's, that, that's not the problem. Just shut it down and move away. Keep on moving. But if you keep popping it up and trying to make it do that again, that's when you get in trouble. David's first look, he said he looked the second time. That's where he got in trouble. But David knew the battle that we all deal with. And he prayed this in Psalm 51. And I want us to pray it together as we leave this morning. I'm going to say it. And then I want you to repeat it with me. This is our prayer this morning, Psalm 51. Lord, wait, let me say it and then we'll repeat it. I'll ask you to repeat it. Create in me a clean heart and renew a right spirit. You ready to say it together? Psalm 51. Here we go. Create in me a clean heart and renew a right spirit. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. the face.